Today, we will look at how to use the EE6B manual flight computer. However, since this topic is a bit long, it will be divided into two videos. In this first part, we will see some basic definitions and the different parts of the device. We will also look at how to use the computer to calculate several parameters such as speed, time, distance, fuel consumption, true airspeed, Mach number, different altitudes, the rate of climb or descent, and also unit conversions. While in the second part, we will look at how to solve navigation problems related to the effect of wind, which includes the calculation of the wind correction angle. With this being said, let's see what is a flight computer. A flight computer is basically a device specially designed to perform calculations that are useful for navigation and the flight in general, such as the ones we mentioned before. Now, it is important to mention that there are different types and models of flight computers. However, in this video, we will only focus on the E6B flight computer, which is one of the most popular models in the market. Also, apart from the model, we can also find different presentations of the flight computer. There is for example the manual or physical one, the electronic one, and also some mobile applications that are used to calculate the same parameters. In this video, we will discuss how to use the physical flight computer. This device has two sides, the calculator side and the wind side, and as their names suggest, the first one is used to perform most calculation problems, while the other is used exclusively for wind problems. So let's take a look at the calculator side first. It consists of a rotating disc, also known as a whiz wheel, and a fixed disc at the bottom. And in it we can find three main scales that are used to make the different calculations. The outer scale is on the fixed disc, while the middle and inner scales are on the rotating disc, as we can see in this image. Now, apart from these, there are another three internal scales or windows inside the rotating disc that are used for certain operations. Also, the flight computer has some special markings, which are used in multiple exercises. One of these markings is the speed index, which is a triangular-shaped mark, located on the middle and inner scales that represents the number 60. We will see how to use it later. Other important marking is the index 10, which is a mark highlighted with a 10 on the middle scale. Now that we know the basic parts of the flight computer, and before looking at the different ways to make calculations, we must understand a key aspect regarding the interpretation of these scales, and it is the magnitude of the units. The thing is that when using the flight computer, it is important to know how to correctly interpret to which order of magnitude corresponds the result. For example, the number 90 in the scale can be interpreted as 0 0.9, 9, 90, 900, or 9000, depending on the type of calculation we are making. So in order to obtain a correct result, we will have to use common sense to determine the order of magnitude of the result. With this in mind, let us begin with the calculation of speed, time, and distance. In this case, the speed will be represented by the speed index, which is the black triangle we mentioned earlier. The distance will be on the outer scale, and time on the middle and inner scales. In summary, we would have an arrangement like this. And when calculating a result, we can always confirm whether it is correct or not, by using the conventional formulas for time, distance, and speed. Let's look at an example. With a speed of 140 knots, how long will it take to travel 250 nautical miles? Well, to solve this problem using the flight computer, we have to align the speed index, which is the black triangle, with the current speed of 140 knots. So then, we align it with the number 14 on the outer scale. Once this is done, all we have to do is look for the distance of 250 miles in the outer scale, which will be represented by the number 25. And then, we just read the corresponding time in minutes on the middle scale, or in hours on the inner scale. Here, as we can see, the results are 10.7 in the middle scale, and 147 on the inner scale, which, by common sense, are interpreted as 107 minutes or 1 hour and 47 minutes, which is basically the same. 
Now, in case we have the information of time and distance, and we have to determine the speed, we just have to align the time from the inner and middle scales with the corresponding distance on the outer scale, and then read the resulting speed pointed by the speed index. Now, if we are handling small values of time and distance, a different speed index should be used. In this case, the seconds index on the middle scale should be used, instead of the black triangle. This way, the resulting time will be given in seconds on the middle scale, and in minutes on the inner scale. Let's see an example of this. With a speed of 120 knots, how long will it take to travel 5 nautical miles? In this case, since the distance is relatively short, we will use the seconds index to determine the time. So then, we have to align the seconds index with the number 12, which represents 120 knots on the outer scale, and then we look for the distance of 5 miles, which is represented by the number 50 on the outer scale. Finally, we just have to read the corresponding time in seconds on the middle scale, and in minutes on the inner scale. Here, as we can see, the results are 15 on the middle scale, and 230 on the inner scale, which by common sense, are interpreted as 150 seconds, or 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Having seen this, let's continue with the fuel consumption calculations, which are very similar to the time, distance, and speed calculations that we just saw. In this case, the consumption per hour will be represented on the outer scale by the speed index, the fuel will be represented on the outer scale, and time will be shown on the middle and inner scales. So in summary, we would have an arrangement like this. And like in the previous case, when calculating a result, we can always confirm whether it is correct or not, by using this conventional formula. Now, as a side note here, we can apply this procedure regardless of the unit of measurement being used. So we could do it using gallons per hour, kilograms per hour, or pounds per hour. Let's see an example. With a consumption of 10 gallons per hour, how much fuel will be consumed in 2 hours and 35 minutes? Well, to answer this question we have to align the speed index with the current fuel consumption of 10 on the outer scale. Then, we look for the time, which will be 155 minutes on the middle scale, which will be represented by 15.5, or we can look for 2 hours and 35 minutes on the inner scale. And finally, we read the corresponding fuel consumed on the outer scale, which in this case is 25.8 gallons. Let's now continue with the calculation of the true airspeed. In this case, the interior windows should be used in conjunction with the three main scales. Here, the true airspeed will be represented by the outer scale, the indicated or calibrated airspeed in the middle scale, and in the upper right inner window we find the pressure altitude inside, and the air temperature outside. Now, the order to correctly calculate the true airspeed is, first align the pressure altitude with the current outside air temperature. And then, read the true airspeed on the outer scale that corresponds to the current indicated airspeed. So in summary, we would have an arrangement like this. In this case, to confirm if the calculation is roughly correct, we can use this rule of thumb, which specifies that the true airspeed increases by 2% per each 1,000 feet. Let's see an example. In this case, we have to determine the true airspeed, given a pressure altitude of 10,000 feet, an outside air temperature of minus 5 degrees, and an indicated airspeed of 110 knots. So here, the first step is to align the pressure altitude of 10,000 feet with the temperature of minus 5 degrees on the inner right window. Then, we look for the number 11 on the middle scale, which will represent 110 knots of indicated airspeed. And finally, we read the corresponding true airspeed of 128 knots on the outer scale. Let's now continue with the true altitude. In this case, as with the previous problem, the interior windows should be used in conjunction with the main scales. Here, the true altitude is represented on the outer scale, the indicated altitude on the middle scale, and the pressure altitude and outside air temperature on the inner left window. In this case, in order to calculate the true altitude, 
We have to align the pressure altitude with the current temperature, and then look for the true altitude corresponding to the current indicated altitude. Let's see an example. Here we have to determine the true altitude, given a pressure altitude of 16,000 feet, a temperature of 0 degrees, and an indicated altitude of 16,400 feet in this case. We first align the altitude of 16,000 feet with the temperature of 0 degrees on the inner left window, and then we look for 16.4 on the middle scale, which will represent 16,400 feet of indicated altitude. Finally, we can see the corresponding true altitude on the outer scale of 17,500 feet. Let's now continue with the calculation of density altitude. For this case, we are only going to use the inner windows. Here, the pressure altitude and outside air temperature are shown on the inner right window, and the resulting density altitude is shown on the central window. So to calculate the density altitude we just have to align the pressure altitude with the current temperature on the inner right window, and then read the corresponding density altitude on the central window. In this case, to confirm if the calculation is correct, we can use this approximate formula, which specifies that density altitude is equal to the pressure altitude plus the ISA deviation multiplied by 120. Let's see an example. We have to calculate the density altitude, given a pressure altitude of 5,000 feet and a temperature of minus 10 degrees. In this case, we have to align 5,000 feet with minus 10 degrees on the inner right window, and then look at the central window to read the resulting density altitude of 3,100 feet. Let's now move on to the calculation of climb and descent rate. In this case, the index 10 should be used instead of the speed index. Here, the rate of climb or descent is represented on the outer scale by the index 10. The altitude difference, which is the vertical distance between the initial altitude and the desired altitude, is represented on the outer scale. And finally, the time in minutes is represented on the middle scale. So in summary, we would have an arrangement like this. And again, we can confirm if the result is correct by using this conventional formula. Let's look at an example. Suppose we have to determine the rate of descent required to descend 8,000 feet in 5 minutes. In this case, we align the altitude of 8,000 on the outer scale with 5 minutes on the middle scale. And finally, we just read the rate of descent with the index 10 on the outer scale, which in this case is 1,600 feet per minute. Let's continue with unit conversions, starting with distance. To do this, on the outer scale there are markings corresponding to each unit of measurement available, which normally are nautical miles, statute miles, and kilometers. So in order to convert units, we just have to align the desired value with its corresponding unit and read the different values expressed in other units. And to confirm if the conversion was correct, we can use these conversion factors. Let's see an example of this. Let's convert 16 nautical miles into kilometers and statute miles. To do this, we just have to align 16 with the arrow of nautical miles, and then read its conversions of 18.4 statute miles and 29.6 kilometers. Let's now move on to conversion of units of volume. In this case, there will be several arrows with different units around the outer scale, which will be used in the same way as with the conversion of distance. Normally, the units available are liters, pounds of fuel, pounds of oil, imperial gallons, and US gallons. So let's look at an example of this. Let's convert 30 liters into the other units of volume. In this case, we just have to align 30 with the arrow of liters, and then read the corresponding values for the other units. Let's now see the conversion between true airspeed and Mach number. In this case, the interior windows should be used in conjunction with the main scales. Here, the true airspeed is represented on the outer scale, the Mach number on the middle scale, and there will be a Mach index on the inner right window, 
which should be aligned with the current temperature. So in this case, to determine the Mach number for a given true airspeed and temperature, we must first align the Mach index with the air temperature, and then read the Mach number on the middle scale that corresponds to the true airspeed. Let's see an example of this. Suppose that we want to determine the Mach number if the temperature is minus 50 degrees, and the true airspeed is 240 knots. In this case, we have to align the Mach index with minus 50 degrees on the inner right window, and then look for the number 24 on the outer scale, which will represent 240 knots of true airspeed. Finally, we just have to read the corresponding Mach number on the middle scale, which in this case is Mach 0.41. Having seen all this, let's move on to the last case of unit conversion, which is temperature conversion. In this case, conversion from degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius and vice versa is done through a fixed scale at the bottom of the fixed disk. This way, we just have to read directly the converted value. For example, if we want to convert 50 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius, we simply have to look for the number 50 on the Fahrenheit scale and read the corresponding value of 10 degrees Celsius. With this, we have already seen most of the operations and functionalities available on the calculator side of the computer. In the next video, we will look at the wind side and how to solve wind-related problems. I hope the information presented on this video was useful. If so, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching.